to the ones who feel overwhelmed by life, you are invited. To those who feel too far gone, you're invited. To those who have regrets, you're invited. And to those who are so numb they can't feel anything, you are invited. To the ones who can't escape the shame of their past, you're invited. To the single moms who are exhausted, you're invited. And to the dads who feel burned out, you are invited. To the ones who feel insignificant, you're invited. To the ones who just can't cut it, you're invited. To the addicts who just can't quit, you're invited. To the ones who are paralyzed by fear and worry, you are invited. To the ones who feel alone, to the ones searching for truth, to the ones who are looking for love in all the wrong places, you are invited. To the ones at the end of their rope, you're invited. To the ones who have everything, you're invited. To the ones who have lost it all, you are invited. To those who feel far from God, you're invited. To those who've given up on themselves, you are invited. To those who've experienced loss this year, you are invited. To the ones searching for purpose, you're invited. And to those who are never, ever invited to anything, you are invited. As I was thinking and praying about my Christmas message this year, what I was going to say, how to convey the message of the coming of our God and King Jesus Christ, as I was thinking through this process and saying, Lord, what, how do you capture this in words, what you've done? I could not get away from this simple little phrase. You are invited. You're invited. I just couldn't get it out of my head. It's like no matter how much I tried, it was just stuck in there. And as I thought about it, I I said, you know, there's really, gosh, there's few things that are as powerful on the human heart as an invitation. As an invitation that says, I want you to be with me. It won't be the same without you. Please, won't you join us? There's something powerful about inviting somebody into something else. And I thought about it. I said, you know what Christmas really is? Christmas, at the end of the day, when you boil it down, it is the ultimate invitation from God to all of earth. It's what it is. It's the ultimate invitation from God. And as I thought more about that, I thought about the words of Jesus in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 29. And I know this isn't a typical or a classic Christmas verse, but I think it captures the heartbeat of heaven for Christmas. And here's what Jesus says. He says this in Matthew 11, 28 to 29. He says, come to me. He says, you're invited. Come to me. Who? Who? All, everyone, you're invited. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Friends, this is what Christmas is all about. It's about God saying to you and to me, come to me. I created you. I designed you. I love you. I'm for you. I'm everything you'll ever need. I'm everything you could ever want and everything you'll ever need. And when you come to me, you will find life, purpose, joy, hope, belonging, forgiveness, grace, mercy, inclusion, truth, passion, and identity. Merry Christmas, Rolling Hills Church. This is what God is inviting us into. Come on, somebody. We're going to preach a little tonight, okay? (laughs) It's okay to clap in church. But I, I tell you what, sometimes what we are expecting... God to be like or how we're expecting God to show up in our lives is far different than what he actually does. Sometimes there's a gap between our expectations and our needs and there is nothing like Christmas time to get you in touch with the reality of expectations. Am I right? I mean, we got any kids in the house tonight? Any kids? Raise your hand or yell or do whatever is going to make your parents uncomfortable right now. Come on, kids. Let me hear you. Say ho, ho, ho. Somebody. I love it. Hey, who's excited? Who kids? Who of you is expecting to get a gift on Christmas morning? That's right. 
You know, I'll never forget, kids, check this out. A few years ago, I came downstairs in the middle of December, and I'm not even kidding you, I saw a box this big under the Christmas tree. And I walked over to that box, and I looked on it, and guess what? My name was on it. It was for me, right? And I immediately became a seven-year-old boy again. I was like, yes, this is going to be great because, because I know my wife and she knows me. We've been married a long time, over 10 years now. And I'm like, you know what? She's a great gift giver. She's really creative. She's thoughtful. She's like a way better gift giver than I am. And she always just nails it right on the head. She, she is an incredible gift giver. So my expectation level for this massive box was on a level 10, okay? Now, to make things even worse, right, or maybe better, I don't know, I, you know, and here's what you got to do. Your, your su- husbands, you know this, wives, you know this. It's got to be subtle, but you can start dropping hints about what you may or may not want for Christmas, I don't know, mid-November or so. So that's like, that's about like legal at that point, right? And I'll never forget, so it was about mid-November. We just so happened to be at the Home Depot. Let's go, man. That's right. And I strategically maneuvered the cart to the right. You know, you go in the main entrance, you go to the right. You're kind of heading towards, if you're at the Home Depot in Folsom, just so you can be with me in this moment. You know, you're heading towards the outside gardening section. But before you get there, you hit the glory zone, the barbecues, right? And right there in the glory zone, I I just paused for a second. I was like, babe, what's this? Is that a Traeger? It's a Traeger, isn't it? So have you ever seen anything like this, babe? It combines all the latest technology of like smoking innovation for meat. I'm like, just say it with me, sweetheart. Automatic pellet feeders. Like this is incredible, right? I was subtle. I was very subtle. And so, you know, to take it up a level, just to make sure she got it, you have to be able, husbands, men, you have to be able to show your wives how a gift like this will actually benefit them too, right? Right? And I said, sweetheart, just imagine, just imagine the tri-tip, right? Just imagine the ribs and the the barbecued chicken like, oh, man, we're going to get saved again on this thing. It's going to be incredible, right? And then we moved on, and that was it. It was just a subtle little moment right in the middle of November, six weeks till Christmas, babe, whispered in the ear as you walked down the aisle. (laughs) But here's what happened. So Christmas morning shows up, and I'm in full-on, like, little boy mode. I'm shoving my kids out of the way. I'm going to be the first one to the Christmas tree. I'm going straight for my Traeger. I have visions of smoked tri-tip dancing in my head. This is the greatest moment ever, and I rip my box open, and pow! Look, this is a great gift for anybody else. Right? I mean, look, the name is Shop Vac, okay? Two problems with that name. Number one, I don't have a shop, okay? I'm not handy. I don't whittle things. I don't have a shop, so I don't need a Shop Vac. And then number two, it's a Vac, right? Nobody on planet Earth loves to Vac. And I'm like, sweetheart, this is not speaking to my soul. I don't even care if it has six and a half horsepower. Like, what vacuum on planet Earth needs six and a half horsepower? It doesn't need that much, right? And she smiled and she said, look, honey, I know that's not what you were expecting, but quite frankly, a Traeger wasn't in the budget. And uh, we do need a shop vac because we're remodeling the house and you're destroying my vacuum by vacuuming up sawdust and all the debris and everything else. We need this. This may not be what you were expecting, but it's definitely what we need right now. And I said, praise God. I love you, sweetheart. So thoughtful. But here's the deal. When you think about the words in John 1.14, it's an amazing verse in the Bible. It says, the word of God became flesh and lived among us. The word of God became flesh, the eternal word of God, right? John 1.1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So God came down in the form of his son, Jesus He came to earth and he lived among us. And I imagine on that night, 2,000 years ago when the baby Jesus was born, there were probably a few people gathered around or who spoke about it shortly thereafter who who saw this miracle, this, this child, and said to heaven, I'm God. 
this is not what we had in mind. This is not what we were expecting, right? Like we need a military-born leader, a Messiah, a king figure to help us overthrow Rome. God, this, this little baby who's born into the family of a carpenter is just not going to cut it. We need some like Exodus-level Mount Sinai thunder and lightning God to come down and save us. This is not what we were expecting. And I think in that moment, heaven whispered back, yeah, but it's everything you will ever need. And it may not be what you were expecting, but it's beyond all your hopes and dreams and expectation because you have a problem way bigger than the Roman Empire. It's called death, and it's coming for everybody. It's called death, and this little child, this God-man who's born of a virgin, is here to defeat death, your biggest issue. He's here to save you. And yeah, it, you know, it's not a Traeger. It's like 10 notches up. It's beyond anything you can ask or imagine, and it may not be what you were expecting, but it's what everybody needs. You know, I don't know why you're here tonight. Maybe you're here tonight because someone invited you. Maybe you're here with your family. Maybe you're here tonight and, you know, Jesus isn't on your wish list. He's not on your radar. It's not something that you're like, man, this is actually what I need right now in my life. But he is, and you're here for a reason. He's everything you need, everything you longed for, and everything you were made for in a relationship with him. And the invitation of Christmas is open to everybody. You're invited. Come as you are. All are invited. But in order for an invitation to be effective, an invitation needs three things. An invitation needs to be understandable. It needs to be realistic. And it needs to be compelling. Understandable, realistic, and compelling. Here's what I mean. Number one, an invitation, in order to be accepted or received by somebody else, has to be understandable. It has to be understood. You can't lose anything in translation. And what I love about this, in John 1.14, it says, the word of God became flesh. The ethereal, uncreated word of God became a man, became a child. And grew up and lived among us. And what God was saying is simply this. Jesus is going to be my ultimate translator. He's going to show the world what I'm like. I'm, I'm, I am going to lose nothing in translation because here I am in the flesh to show you my heart. I was thinking about this idea of lost in translation. And I think so often when the invitation of Christmas is extended or when people hear about Christianity, they think back on a bad experience with church or maybe a Christian that they knew who wasn't kind to them or loving to them. And they think, man, this whole idea of Christianity is just lost in translation for me. But I think God wants to re-extend the invitation today. And as I was thinking about this idea of miscommunication or something being lost in translation, it made me think about my favorite Christmas movie. We got any Elf fans in the room? Yeah, we do. I love that scene when Buddy the Elf meets his dad for the first time. You all know what I'm talking about? He shows up and the dad, Walter Hobbs, he thinks it's a Christmas gram and Buddy's like, it's me, your son. Do you all remember this scene? Come on, say it with me. I love you. I love you. I love that line. It's completely lost in translation. Do you remember what Walter Hobbs says next? He's like, that was weird. Someone called security, right? Like, he literally was like, I don't know what's happening right now. This guy is singing some weird made-up song. I don't know what's going on. But he's like, Dad, it's you, right? And then in this amazing moment where he's like, I love you, Dad, he gets completely rejected because the whole message is lost in translation. And that the tragic thing about Christmas to me is that you have a heavenly father up in heaven who is shouting down to the earth, I love you, I love you, I love you. And somehow it's getting lost in translation. And so he says, look, I'm sending my son Jesus John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he sent his only son so that to die for the world because of love, so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. It's Christmas is God saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. Come to me. You're invited. And, and literally, if you want to know the love of God, he says, look at my son, Jesus. 
If you want to know the mercy and compassion of God, he says, look at Jesus. If you want to see the power of God, watch Jesus as he walks on water and heals the lame and cleanses the leopard and heals the leper. And It's been a long three days. And, and, and heals the blind, right? And he says, look at my son. He's the ultimate translator of heaven to earth. The word became flesh, and I love you. You're invited. He then goes on, and the second thing, every good invitation has to be, it has to be realistic, right? It has to be attainable. You can't invite somebody into something if there's no chance they can actually receive it. And so what happens in John 1.14, it says, the word became flesh and lived among us. That means God came down. He knew we couldn't go to heaven. He knew we couldn't attain that. So he said, I'm coming down to you. I'm going to make myself approachable. And I love this idea. It made me think of, again, a little while back at the church that I was pastoring at in Atlanta. Um, there was a guy that went to our church. He was actually an astronaut, a, a bona fide astronaut, believe it or not, right? Shane Kimbra. And this guy spends months every single year up in the International Space Station. And our lead pastor at the church, he said, hey, guys, I got kind of a treat for us. This is going to be pretty awesome. But we're actually going to do a live, like, FaceTime conversation with the International Space Station and Shane Kimbra for our staff meeting today. I'm like, sweet. This is going to be awesome, right? He goes, it's kind of tricky, kind of crazy. Um, at exactly 337, we have an eight-minute window to the ISS as it travels through space over Atlanta. And we're like, whoa, this is intense. Like, this is, is this going to work, you know? And so at 337, we're all gathered around the TV. I feel like I'm watching a moon landing for the first time. I'm like, this is crazy. And we hit the button, and up pops Shane doing flips in midair, like in the middle of the International Space Station. And he can see us, and we can see him. And I'm like, we got eight minutes of chat time with outer space. Like, this is, what, what is the world that we live in right now? And he's, you know, up there, hey, guys, how's it going? We're asking him questions, and I'm, you know, blurting out brilliant questions like, Shane, what does it feel like to be weightless? I don't know. And, and you know, he looked back at me, and he's like, Jonathan, it kind of feels like flying. It's incredible. And then he said this to me. He said these words. He goes, man, why don't you come up here and try it for yourself? And I was like, that's an awesome invitation, Shane. I'd love to. Heck yeah. Let me just call an Uber. I'll be right there. I'm going to the International Space Station to do flips and fly in midair with Shane Kimbra. One problem, that was not a realistic invitation. <laughs> There's no way that any of us in this room, unless you're a certified astronaut who's done the training and jumped through the hoops, can go to the International Space Station. It's an unrealistic invitation. And what happened is this. If you look at the Old Testament, if you, if you look at the full story of Scripture and redemption, in the Old Testament, an invitation to hang out with God was kind of a scary thing. The only grid that most people had for God was power and majesty and creator and glory. And when he came down, the earth shook, the people trembled, and they were like, all right, we need to make sure God stays there and we stay here. And there is no real invitation into God's holy presence for people that have turned their back on him. And so he goes, look, I know that you guys can't like, you know, climb your way back into heaven, so I'm coming to you. Heaven's coming to earth. And the beauty of Christmas, the beauty of this invitation is now God becomes approachable. What's more approachable than a child? The reason he wasn't royal born in Herod's palace, you know, is because royalty isn't approachable. But a carpenter's son is. He said, I want everyone to be able to come to me and to receive relationship with their heavenly father through me. God became approachable. The invitation to relationship with God became realistic. The third thing an invitation must have is it has to be compelling. You see, all great invitations, they cause a little bit of FOMO, don't they? A little bit of fear of missing out. It's like, I, I don't want to miss out on that. That sounds like an awesome invitation to something amazing, right? I want to be a part of that. And if you hear the original words of the angels on the, on the very first Christmas in Luke 2, 8 to 11, here's what they say. It says, Luke 2, 8 to 11, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for I bring you good news of great 
joy. That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who's Christ the Lord. Unto you in the city of Bethlehem is born this day everything you will ever need for life here and eternal life after. A Savior, one who came to put you back in right standing with God, one who came to give you new life. This is good news of great joy. That word great in the Greek is actually mega. This is mega joy, right? This is if you don't receive this gift, you're missing out on the greatest gift that has ever been given to humanity from the beginning of time. It's a gift of new life, of spiritual life, to go from death to life and then eternal life. And this is the beauty of Christmas. God is saying, look, I'm not an angry God up in heaven looking to send my wrath. I'm actually sending all of my wrath down on my son, Jesus, on the cross so that you can live free. Uh, he's going to take what you deserve so that you can have new life. And this is the invitation of Christmas. It's good news of great joy, of mega joy for all the people. An invitation into life and to love, and to belonging, and to joy unshakable. And the invitation is for everyone. God invited the shepherds who were watching the flocks by night. He said, you're invited. The wise men who traveled from far away, he said, you're invited. The Roman soldiers who nailed him to a cross, he said, you're invited. To the thieves that hung on either side, he said, you're invited. To the fishermen on the shore, he said, you are invited. To the adulterous woman at the well, he said, you are invited. To the tax collectors, sinners, lepers, lame, blind, unqualified, unreligious, don't have it all together, you are invited. Merry Christmas, somebody. This is good news. You guys with me tonight? This is good news, right? And this is the invitation of Christmas. This is the invitation to all of us because we're all a mess. We've all got issues, right? We all need a little shop vac in our lives. That's just the reality of it. And God said, you're invited. You're invited and I love you. And, and here's the truth. And if you don't hear anything else tonight, just please hear these words. You cannot appreciate the birth in Bethlehem until you have experienced the cross at Calvary. You cannot appreciate the birth in Bethlehem, the invitation of God, until you see the end of the story at Calvary. Until you see heaven shouting to earth, I love you, I love you, I love you. And you're invited. Christmas was the beginning of the story, but the end of the story was the cross and the resurrection. And the fact that one day he's coming again to wipe away every tear from every eye. To reign and rule as king and lord of the entire earth forever and ever and ever. It's the story of Christmas. I'll close with this. This past week I was talking to a pastor friend of mine in Texas a uh, dear friend from back in my seminary days, and we were catching up and praying for each other, and uh, he said, man, I gotta be honest, it's been a really rough week for me. And I said, why, what's been going on? He said, man, we've had a dear couple in our church that has just been going through a really scary time. And I said, what happened? And he said, there was a husband and a wife, they'd been married for 35 years, they had four kids, and um, the wife had struggled with debilitating anxiety and depression for most of their marriage and even suicidal thoughts. And earlier this week, the husband woke up, the kids woke up one day, and the wife was gone. He noticed that a large amount of cash had been taken out of an ATM not too far away, and she was gone. And he started calling her, texting her, emailing, calling friends and family. Have you seen her? Have you seen her? Have you seen her? He called the police. Shortly thereafter, they started to look for her, and very soon a missing persons report was filed. And days turned into a week, and so he decided to hire a private investigator to go find her. And after a few days, actually the private investigator did find her. He came directly to the husband. He goes, I found her. I found your wife. He said, where is she? He goes, she's in some old Roach motel in downtown Houston. I didn't make contact with her. I didn't want to scare her off. I came straight to you. And he goes, I think you should go down there. So he called a neighbor, and he had the neighbor come over and watch the kids. He got in his truck, and he drove straight to the hotel. 
He didn't know what to expect, but he walked up and he, he knocked on the door. And his wife came to the door and answered. She looked at him. She didn't say anything. She turned right back around, went into the hotel room, and packed her bags without saying a word. She walked out past her husband and got in the passenger seat of the truck and sat down without saying a word. And her husband got in the truck next to her, and he, he looked at her and said, Sweetheart, where have you been? I've been calling you and texting you. The whole city's looking for you. All the friends and we're all so concerned. Why didn't you respond? And here I am at your door and you just walked out without a second thought. And she looked at her husband and she basically said, I couldn't bear the thought of being a burden to you or the kids any longer. I was so sick of myself and my depression and my anxiety. I just wanted to disappear. I wanted to end my life. And I literally, she said, I couldn't respond. I was in the deepest pit of my life. I turned my phone off. I couldn't, I didn't even have the strength to reach out at all. She goes, I needed somebody to come and get me. And she said, thank you. I needed you to show up at my door and get me because I could not get out of this room myself. And as I'm hearing this story from my friend, as I'm thinking about Christmas, the thing that struck me and landed on my heart is I said, that's what Christmas is. It's God coming down and knocking on the door of our hearts and saying, I don't care where you've been. I don't care how dark the room is or what part of town it's in or what you've been through or walked through or what you've done. I'm here knocking at the door and inviting you into everything you've ever needed. Forgiveness, grace, love, and a fresh start. That's the story of Christmas. That's the invitation of Christmas. God came down. And I know in a room like this, there's probably many of you who've never opened the door of your heart to receive a relationship with your creator, with Jesus Christ. And I don't want us to move from this moment without giving you an opportunity to respond. There are connect cards on the seat backs in front of you and I'm going to lead, lead us all in a prayer in a moment. And if you want to pray along with me, it has to be your words from your heart. But if you want to pray along with me, I would love for you to do that. I'd love for you to fill out that Connect card and let somebody know that you prayed that prayer with us today. You can turn it in at any of the connection points or at the kiosk throughout the, ca the campus. But let's bow our heads and let's pray together in this moment. And these, these words have to be from your heart. They're your words to God. They're not mine. But it should go something like this. Just say, Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. And in your heart, say, Jesus, thank you for living a perfect life and dying on the cross for my sins. In your heart to him, confess the fact that you have, you've done wrong. You've turned your back on God. You haven't loved him as you should. You haven't had faith in him. And then right now in your heart, reach out to him. Put your trust in him as your Lord and Savior who died on the cross for your sins and rose again to new life so that you could live in relationship with your heavenly Father. Holy Spirit, right now I just pray in this room that you would be knocking on hearts that need to turn to you. Lord, we love you and we're grateful for the gift of Christmas and the invitation that you've given us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Merry Christmas, everybody.